making good trouble every which way we can. So thank you all for being here today. I'm pretty excited about this lineup. Um, so get ready to get in some trouble today in honor of John Lewis for his birthday is what? February 21st. So what a great way to celebrate this day today for a legendary civil rights worker that dedicated his life to advancing human rights. And I know that everybody in this room has a piece of them that is making trouble all the time for our democracy. So a shout out to you for keeping in action. And I know that we're all super inspired. So we have a lineup today that will also is all about making good trouble. We're gonna learn about people doing some really great stuff. We have the delegate here, Ibrahim Samara. Welcome delegate, are you in the room? Welcome. And we have Matt Rogers, a candidate in HD 47 and also hey, founder. Hey. Hey, or is that you? How are you? That's me. Yeah, that uh, I'm here. Okay, awesome. Glad you're in the room. We have Matt Rogers here, candidate for HD 47, and he's a founder of 90 for 90 and Politic Dope. I can't wait to hear about what you're up to, Matt. Um, we have uh, in our section about making, uh, learning about strong men and women making history in Virginia. We have Zahara Ford, a young poet from Loudoun. Woo, give it up for Zahara. So great you're here today. We have Sandy Treadway, Virginia State Librarian, and Zakia Ali, educator, that will be here talking about how they're making some good trouble. And lastly, oh my gosh, my heart is just a beating for this one. We have Chris Matthews here, musician, also always making good trouble. So let's get ready to just have a good session today. But first, I have to do my shout out to my lunch team. I got my badass woman here, my team making good trouble with me. We got Stair Calhoun. How are you, Stair? Give a wave. Ambassador of Buzz behind the controls. And then I got Robin Zeff Warner, the, the show wizard. Hey, Robin, postcards from Virginia. And of course, my fabulous, wonderful co host, Krista Jones, Vote Lead Impact. Where you at? Yeah, looking good. How are you feeling today? Excellent. I am so excited to talk about making good trouble. And just a reminder to everyone, please put in the chat all the ways you're making good trouble. Definitely. That's right. I think that's, yeah, I want to hear all about it. So I'm glad you're, you're here today with us. And of course, we couldn't have a show without Louisa Borowski here. Um, she's the leader of the Virginia Grassroots Coalition back from Pittsburgh, PA. Are you unpacked now? Did you get all the, the kibasi out of your suitcase? I am back and it has been a crazy month in Virginia. So there's a lot to talk about. Awesome, I can't, I'm excited. I hope you did bring some kibasa. I will be stopping over to pick some up. So I'm glad you're back safe and sound. And then of course, a, a shameless shout out to ask people in the room to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Robin, if you don't mind putting that in the chat and put a thumbs up on our videos, because of course, all these guests here are making good content. Why not make sure that we get it out there? That's the purpose. We are people about action. And also um, make sure that we wanted to talk real quick about our backers and you'll see them in the room. Early backers, make sure you put your hand up, click on your hand signal, or if you don't have your Zoom background, these are people in, that have been supporting our show. We really want to say thank you. As in March, we're going to announce that we will be starting our subscription program for the show. We have a lot to tell you about. This show is always going to be here. It's uh, free, but the subscription gives people some sneak peeks, different ways to support our work, and this is how we can do our work. So thank you to our backers. And, and I just want to make sure we're always thanking you. And um, stay tuned. After the show, we always have the after chat. I see Laura with your backdrop on, Laura Martinez. Thank you for backing us. Awesome. I see so many hands up in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. With that said, I'm going to hand it over to my friend, Luisa. Take it away with the legislative update. Thank you so much, Catherine. So... I want to start off this Friday a way we don't usually get to start off, which is we need to celebrate, guys. We are starting to get bills passed, and they are going to be going to the governor's desk for signature. So if you have a drink, whether it's water with you or whatever, raise your glass bottle. 
we have been working our butts off for the last month and it is starting to pay off. So I'm gonna share with you what we've got going right now. So the great news is our reproductive health care bill, which Senator McClellan put in, has been passed. That bill repeals the ban on state exchange insurance from offering um, abortion coverage. So now abortion coverage can be covered in the exchange where it wasn't before. We're very excited about that. We've got two gun bills that are going to the governor's desk. One was from Senator Favola, um, which ensures uh, that guns are taken away from domestic violence abusers. Huge, great for um, you know the issue on domestic violence, trying to make our women safer and others safer at home. Um, we also have no guns at the polls has passed. So one less thing to have to worry about because we're still gonna still gonna be dealing with COVID. So no guns at the polls is fantastic. And finally, even though we did not get the criminal or the um, campaign finance reform that we wanted, we did get a study group and the study group, which is in the bill by Delegate Bulova establishes a comprehensive campaign finance reform study, which we are hoping will then provide the, the path to getting legislation passed next year. So we're super excited. That being said, we still have work to do as always. I'm going to put in the chat a call to action for our two pipeline bills. Those started in the Senate, they are now in the House and we need to contact our delegates on, on the House floor to make sure they know we want them to vote for these bills. So I'll put that in the chat for you guys. I also am going to put a link to our website. Dennis has done a fabulous job creating cl easy clicks to do these calls to action. So there are a couple that are still up there. So please go to the website and take action there as well. And then finally, Kristen has been working on our, uh, Christina has been working on our bill tracker and she's been fabulous just keeping us up to date on where our bills are. It's hard to follow where, where they go and when they're docketed and she's been really helping us keep track. And then the final thing I wanna note is it's almost time for elections again, everyone. So we are getting excited about our election season in Virginia and we have a big grassroots effort to support and create these debates for our top of the ticket candidates. So I'm gonna put in the chat, we really wanna encourage you to sign up for these debates so that you get a chance to learn about all of our fantastic democratic candidates in the primary. There's going to be an attorney general forum on March 2nd, a lieutenant governor's debate on March 11th and the governor's debate on March 16th. This will be the first round of big debates. The democratic party will be hosting debates for the governors much later in the spring. This is our chance as the grassroots to get out front and say, these are the issues we care about. These are the issues that we want our candidates to be discussing and to be putting on their platforms. So that is my update. I'm excited that we have stuff to celebrate and look forward to continuing our work with you guys. I have a question. Do you have any yes. inside information now that we know the census data came in late and they're not gonna do the whole gerrymandering, whatever thing, you know, um, they're not going to be able to re draw new lines. Do you know if they're just going to have one primary in June or they're going to still do the August one? Any inside scoop? They haven't said yet. Um, and I'm not sure. That being said, you know, what this does set us up for, though, is the very, very challenging triple year in a row House yes. of Delegates races, right? So that means our delegates are going to run this year on the old lines. They're going to run next year on the new lines. And then once again on the new lines, the third year, so that we're back in regular uh, schedule. Yeah. So what that means for us is, especially those, area, those delegates who need our support, there's six of them that had a really tough time winning their races um, right. in 2019. We're going to need to be there for them. And any time that we're investing this year is going to be replicated over the next three years in terms of our impact. So that's going to be really critical. And we do have some potential flips as well, which will be coming up soon with information on those. So yes, as usual, a very busy. Well, I, that will be interesting because like you said, that that that's a lot, but that sets us up for the next the next segment really well. So Louisa, thank you so much. Absolutely. I hope you're enjoying the, the nice cozy weather. <laughs> 
Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and we're glad we can just make it a great day. So I'm so glad you're here and we'll see you next week. I know you'll be back with another great report. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, All guys. right. So that sets us up. I mean, the idea of triple elections, a lot of uh, crazy stuff on the ballot and running for office. We have the next segments all about lawmakers making good trouble. And I'm hoping we have ready to go delegate Samara. Ibrahim, I am here. Are you here? Oh, let yes, me see. I am. Oh, there you are. How are you? I'm good, Catherine. Nice to see you and everybody here today. It's such a pleasure to be amongst you all. We're like in the middle of session, but I'm glad to jump in for five. Um, okay, you good. You got it. Well, you look good. I like your new glasses. Are those those are kind of spiff? Is that your new look? I like it. Cyber Monday deals. That's all. Got a <laughs> bunch of those glasses and blue filter protecting my eyes. So. Well, I'm going to set you up because see, when I met you, you were just running for <laughs> office, okay? And I stood outside the polls and watched people roll in to vote for you. And you're familiar to this back-to-back -back voting out there. I mean, I think you saw so many. We had to do so many elections for that that seat. That when Jennifer Boisco moved on, but I kind of want to get personal with you today, um, also about just letting us know about times where you made some good trouble, and I know that even on your website is running for office that you 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 know your style is really not sticking to the old ways, bringing new ways, making people think about things in new ways. So tell me a little bit about your passion about yeah. about, about being in in office, and also where you where you think we need to make more good trouble also. Well, Catherine, I appreciate that. I never get to talk about this stuff. I, I come from a very rich organizing background, uh, one that started very early on in my life with my father, a civil rights leader in Chicago, uh, registering Muslim Americans to vote in particular, which were very heavily targeted after 9-11, trying to empower a community that was struggling, one that he knew really well. And uh, he paid the price pretty hard, and my family did too. But we channeled that energy into something very positive, into trying to do more positive change for society. You might know some of those types of families out there in America that do that kind of work. And Representative, former, uh, our, our late Representative John Lewis is no, uh, uh, a, a no shy person to that. Uh, him and his family and his extended family of people, organizers that worked with him uh, from MLK Jr., of course, down. Uh, is it, those are people that have been around for a minute doing that. And I consider myself as part of that kind of long tradition uh, growing up on the south side of Chicago uh, and, and as well as uh, some some pretty uh, lower income suburbs uh, that people move out to after they're gentrified. It, it gives me a lot of passion for things like affordable housing. Uh, uh, being a doctor, uh, I know firsthand is a very big deal uh, in my kind of communities that I came that I grew up in, uh, these lower income communities. And so I, I made sure to learn. Uh, how to use my hands to help people, but at the same time also uh, how to use my knowledge as a doctor of, of healthcare, uh, 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 of the private healthcare market through whether it be private insurances or private hospitals or private pharmaceutical companies and how they uh, hit people's backs pretty hard. Um, I went to, near, went to university at American University, uh, and, which is a very rich political environment as well, so I got to do a lot of activism there. Uh, you know, I, I'll say this, I think on, on, the, on the topic of good trouble, on the topic of good trouble, boy, is it such a passion for me to do that. Uh, I've, go ahead, Catherine, you were no, going to say. So if I think I, what you're talking about, you made the papers on a very historic time when um, it was Virginia's very important historic celebration and uh, President Trump was going to come and it caused quite a issue. And what you may not know is that I would, you may were making good trouble and I, we didn't know that that would happen that day, but I was on the outside of that building where Trump was entering with other activists, riding my bike there. And I, you know, I was like, you know, just, just equally outside going, okay, we have to stand up for our democracy and we really had to do this. And then later when I learned, I'd love for you to tell your story because it gave me and all of us in the grassroots, you may have gotten in trouble by some of the people in the Democratic Party, but you were our hero. You stood well, up I, that day. You stood up that day. That's what John Lewis was talking about, correct? That is correct. And 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 you know what? Uh, we were talking earlier about how we need to hold our majority, how we have six seats uh, that we need to protect. Well, we also now have another dynamic here at play because of the great work that grassroots organizers like yourself and everybody in the call did today is that we have strong progressives in the legislature that are getting primaried by people to the right of them, people that are, do represent a more conservative version of what their Democratic Party is. Now, we are a big umbrella, but we do believe that every 
uh, portion of the Democratic Party deserves to be existing, whether it be progressive or to the, to the middle between progressive and center. Uh, I think that's what makes our party great. Uh, but these are this is what a primary is for. It's a healthy format for us to push forward our values. I do represent a deep blue district. And in that deep blue district, I represent very progressive values. And those progressive values led me to stand up to Trump in Jamestown. Uh, he was a threat to our democracy, not as obvious as it is today. I saw it uh, very clearly so. I grew up in a country also uh, abroad because my father was was actually denied re-entry to the U.S. because of our poor immigration system. Uh, I've lived in Jordan where there is dictatorship, where I know these tactics. And so when Trump was going down that escalator, I immediately read right through the room and knew it. And so I just wanted my moment to come forward and try to show that people show people that what this is, 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 is a big threat to our democracy. And as we know, today is a huge threat. So standing up to Trump in Jamestown was a no brainer. I brought in some signs with me, uh, <laughs> hid them in my back. Nobody knew what was going on. Uh, uh, Delegate Dana, Danica Rome was with me then. Uh, she she uh, witnessed it all. I have I have witnesses. Uh, the 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 signs almost slipped through my uh, through off of my back, and security almost caught the signs. Uh oh. Uh, but but I made it through, and and we did what we did. We made history in the 400th anniversary of our democracy here in Virginia, making it very clear that the next hundred years of Virginia are going to be ones that include everybody, especially those on the margins. Yeah, no, and, and that was, a, it was a day that all, you know, got us all riled up and we were like, I can't, we can't be silent and we didn't know what would happen on the inside. And there you stood up and I'm saying that that inspired all of us. Uh, and I think when John Lewis talks about why that's so important to stay silent, because you get, you got, you got into some, you know, like I said, it doesn't mean you don't get backlash when you stand up. Sometimes it's, you get criticized, right? And, um, but that's part of just really standing up for what's right and being an immigrant from an immigrant family. And I am too from, and my grandma always told us to hide things in our bra. I don't know. So it's like, that's where we hid our stuff. So no one could find it, you know, <laughs> she's like, oh, put it down or in your sock. So anybody that's from an Italian family, we, we know what I'm talking about. If so, I had a bra, I would have used it. You, you, <laughs> you could, but you know what? It, it's, so it is true. I love how you're just invented because I also think being from, other countries, when immigrants come to this country, they bring this understanding because they know what a dictator looks like. I know what crim crime bosses look like. I, I lived in Youngstown, Ohio, and I saw how they racketeered and ran our, our place around. I knew Trump right away. I'm like, he's a crime boss. He's a crook. He's a crook. Yeah, no, he's a crook. So anyways, thank you so much. And you know, I know you're running in your, in your area and you're in district, House District 86. Tell me just real quick that- yeah. Herndon Reston uh, is the majority of it, uh, a little bit of Sterling and a little bit of Chantilly. Right. Uh, very, very proud to represent a very progressive area. Uh, and I will continue to fight for those progressive values. And like I said, they are absolutely now uh, under a microscope as to whether or not we need progressive values in Virginia. And I am here to say that we absolutely do. All the progress that happened in the last few years happened because of good trouble, like yeah. the one that we living, we're living, we're, we're remember, remembering today with, the represent, with our late representative, John Lewis. He gave us a lot of good trouble examples. And I continue to use that to our advantage here in deep progressive areas to make sure that we push our majority, our trifecta majority to deliver very progressive results. Headlines like the New York Times saying, uh, Virginia moving uh, in the progressive direction very fast. That's because yeah. of people like you guys, all of you all on the call today. And yeah. I appreciate you all so much. I appreciate that shout out to everybody in the room. So thank you and you get back in there and go get right. to work. And thank you for all you do, sir, for your service. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Catherine. Good seeing Robin there, everybody. Bye, y'all. Yep, yep. Awesome. Okay. Oh my gosh. So exciting to, to see you, Brim. Um, and our next segment is going to be equally exciting because um, there is people all over Virginia pushing boldly, pushing the envelope for good trouble. And this, uh, I wasn't going to call him a young man. You're allowed to do that when you're a little older, you know. So um, Matt Rogers is here from Arlington. He's a candidate. He's actually running for office in, in House District 47. He founded 90 for 90 and Politidope. Did, is these all true facts, Matt? Are you here? Oh, there you are. Uh, yes. Yeah. Let me. Uh, so you've been everything you said was correct, but I did not find found ninety for ninety. That was founded in twenty fifteen by folks down in Deb, uh, Deborah Gardner's neck of the woods down in Chesterfield. 
Uh, that was uh -huh. with, uh, Dr. Reed at 90 for 90. Um, so that's 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 just an organization that I'm I'm very friendly with, that people that I believe in their in their mission. So that's not mine, but uh, I'm happy to be. Uh, well, Ro, we know what happens with the grassroots. The same thing with us. We all and all of us in this room are part of each other's organizations. So it's like we all feel connected. So I feel you. I'm yeah. excited to meet you because I I have to tell you a lot of people in this room follow you on Twitter. Um, you have bold things to say every day. <laughs> you are really uh, what I what we've been uh, what attracted us to getting you in the room today was more about your approach to politics in the Democratic Party. We get frustrated in the grassroots with kind of the status quo yeah. party that we're kind of come up against sometimes. And here is this uh, um, we hear this voice on Twitter calling out some of this and really kind of moving boldly and talking about um you know, what, how we need to reform some of this or just think differently. So I would love to just throw it over to you and talk a little bit of how you're making some trouble, you know, in that area, good trouble though. Yeah, I, uh, so thanks for, uh, you know, uh, the kind words to say that, you know, the clarion voice to, to reach out to folks. Uh, I do have a, I do believe I have a different approach to politics that, uh, that attracts some, some don't love it, uh, but, uh, essentially uh, it brings me here today, essentially. I've been working in politics since I was at VCU uh, and my formative times were uh, high traffic voter registration uh, and then going out and hitting doors and again in Deborah Robin's neck of the woods. So I come at it from a, a perspective of, of, you know, we need to democratize these things. And so often we have conversations and folks in the party who, are afraid of elections happening. I mean, the district that I live in, the 47th district, uh, is an overwhelmingly Democratic district. Uh, there is no threat that a, a Republican would represent this district. Um, however, there's a natural inclination or disinclination towards uh, anybody ever stepping up. Uh, essentially, this the idea around this district and many others is that it's to be uh, to be handed to one or to be inherited by one. And I don't believe public service uh, works that way. And I know a lot of y'all don't either, um, which is why I've been part of this effort this year to get people to, reg uh, of course, register to vote. I almost said that because I love it so much, uh, but also get people to, to get themselves on the ballot to run in over, uh, even overwhelmingly Republican districts, swing districts, I see my, my friend Katie Sponsler in the room. What's up? Yeah, Katie's here. Uh, yeah, Katie Sponsler. She ran in 2017 in a different district uh, before they had the uh, overwhelmingly uh, racist gerrymander that that made uh, that just not fair. But I'll uh, I'll stop rambling. I'll let you get to some questions. I'm sure you have questions. Well, well you know, it's kind of informal questions, but just more about, I just was really in, you know interested in, and that vision about some of that strategy. I mean, when we came into the grassroots and all these in 2017, so many people stood up to run and the infrastructure wasn't there. And you're kind of pushing this 100 for 100 idea. Talk a little bit about what you feel and why that's important that everybody be in a seat and contest it. Not everybody believes that. Some people even out in rural areas may say, you know what, we're no chance to win and it just deflates people too. We have to learn to be strategic and smart and. I'm not sure, but I believe that, but um, I'm, I'm interested in yeah, what you believe. You teed it up. Uh, I'm a basketball coach, football coach, so that's an alley-oop right there. Uh, I think um, I'll keep it PG-13, and, and that's not true. Um, I think, you know, the sports analogy here is even if you have Jerry Rice, Randy Moss, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan on the other team, do you run up and down the floor playing four on five, not, not guarding the guy? Right. Um, should we let Republicans who've got $100,000 in their bank accounts have a freebie to go and spend all that money on loading up against Katie Sponsor? She can very much win this year. Deborah Gardner, she could very much win this year. And in her area, I've been part of making sure we got darn candidates uh, up and down. We, we, uh, all of Chesterfield County filled, uh, all Virginia Beach area filled. Right. And uh, what we're going to do, we're already at basically, uh, I got my uh, insider notes here. So if you're checking, oh, I love insider out, notes. <laughs> if you're checking, like notes. <laughs> if 
if you're checking BPAP, you're a little late on this. Um, if you're checking State Board of Elections, you're a little late on this. Uh, but essentially, we are, by this time next week, we'll, we'll be challenging more districts in this election cycle than we challenged in 2017, which was amazing. We got 88 last year. Um, or, or last, uh, last time, we got 92. But we're going to go 100 for 100. Thank you all for having me here. Yeah. Uh, if you want to hear about my candidacy and why I'm running for office, it's going to take a lot more than five minutes. Well, well, we'll have you back on that. But I, I, I mean, I think what we want to do is take a look at you. And I think we see, we like what we see. And I like your thinking on this. So I, we appreciate that because I, I think you're, you're in the right, you're in the right, in the right room um, because we believe, you know, it takes the grassroots working together and, and also challenging some old concepts. Um, they didn't want to, uh, you know, believe us when we said about postcards. Sometimes it gave us trouble. They, you know, so we had to push back. We wanted to support Money for vendors. Why, why would we ever do anything that's not geared towards getting people rich? That, thank you so much. That's yeah, exactly what it was. And then also we said, let's go support people in other districts. And that took a while to take, uh, you know, that we called that adopt a candidate. But now it's it's common. And look at us. Well, we've made some changes too. So thank you. We will have you back. I'm going to follow you on Twitter. And everybody else, uh, Stare, put some handles in. Stare loves Twitter handles. She's our Twitter queen. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. You take uh, wait, wait, we've got. Oh wait, oh wait, I forgot. Hats for Matt. Hats for Matt. Matt. So Stan, come on, Matt. We got a hat for Matt. Okay, oh, we got. Oh, nice. Thank you. And we go, we win. So we're gonna do some prizes. Spin the wheel or do no, it's not a spin this time, Robin. What is it? It's. We're gonna send you a hat, Matt. You'll get one regardless. Catherine, can you see it? Yeah, I can. Go ahead. All right, here we are. Ready? Here we go. go. Let's find. Wow. Oh. It, oh, let's see. Well, okay, tell us what. Uh, put your information, Jeanette, for the winner in the chat to stare and send us your address, and you will get a hat, Matt. Okay, we have one. We have yeah, one, one more, more, right? One more. Here we go. Who's gonna win? I love it. Oh my God, Christina Hagen from Family Friendly Economy. Yeah. Well, so Matt, we will send you a hat, Matt, because you're our hat, Matt. This is our whole segment about Matt and hats. All put right. your um, put your address in the chat to stare. Okay. okay. She won't tell anybody. Okay. Don't try <laughs> to sign any petitions for me, guys. Oh yeah, put yeah exactly. Okay, you take care. So glad you're here, and I'm gonna hand this next session over, um, Krista, my friend. You, ha you have to follow the hat segment, but it's women making history in good trouble. So go ahead. I'm going to leave you to it, my friend. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Louisa, for those great updates and inspiring us to make even more good trouble. And I think what, to me, what I take away from John Lewis and making good trouble is that there are so many ways to do it. And that's one of the ways we wanted to spotlight good trouble on the show today. So in this next segment, we're going to talk to Zaria Ford, who is a young poet, who's going to read her poem in just a moment. We're also going to talk to Zakia Ali, who's an educator who is finding new ways to teach Black history. And we're also going to talk to Sandy Treadwell, who is a uh, who is at the Sandy Treadway, who's at the Library of Virginia's. But first, let's have Zaria Ford come up and she's going to read a portion of her poem, Colors, her award winning poem. Hi. Um, first, I wanted to um, correct you. My name is pronounced Zaria. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but I can um, start my poem. I'm the blackest in my class, the Jim Crow amongst doves. Does my white paint my black or does my black paint my white? Maybe I should change to make things right. Straight hair, skinny bones, blue eyes and new clothes. I do my best to fit in, but sometimes I forget my skin tone. Class, today we're learning about slavery. I feel curious eyes turn to me. Up and down they look every nook and cranny thinking about where I would be in that history. Questions fall like raindrops in a hurricane. Are those extensions? Can you let me say the N word? You're brave, 
make you look like an alien, like the one from The Predator. Your hair looks so soft. Can I touch it? Wow. Feels like a cloud. If I had hair like yours, I'd be proud. Shot dead every day, a zombie trying to crawl out its grave. Every bullet takes a bit of black with it. Lacking knowledge in my culture, it's a deficit. Dark is bad. Lighten up. You're too young to be thinking about this stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zaria. Thank you for correcting me as well. Yeah. Let's bring up um, Sandy as well as Zakia. And first, I just want, so I'm, I'm really excited to be one of the honorees this year for the Strong Men and Women of Virginia uh, Award from the Library of Virginia and Dominion. So Sandy, can you just talk a little bit about what the award is? Yes, uh, the Strong Men and Women program is something we started uh, back in 2008. And since 2013, we've partnered with Dominion. And its purpose is um, to highlight the stories of living persons of African-American background in Virginia today, their accomplishments that are often overlooked and, and not appreciated, and also to recognize that everyone today stands on the shoulders of those who went before. So we always include every year two or three individuals from history who are no longer with us, but whose accomplishments have really not been fully recognized. So that program honors all of those people. And, and since 2008, you can imagine, we've got quite a number of honorees. Uh, normally we honor them at an event here in downtown Richmond that draws sometimes 600 people, which is wonderful. But the library doesn't want this to just be about one evening. Um, it, so we produce a poster that goes out to all Virginia schools that highlight the honorees from a given year, tells their stories, and we encourage teachers to use them in, in Black History Month activities. We also do a traveling exhibition that features each year's honorees, and it's here at the library right now, and next week it will start traveling to public libraries across Virginia, and, and often they keep them going for two or three years, which is wonderful. Um, when this segment is done, I'll put in the chat the link where um, you all can nominate people for next year um, because we do, we, it's an open nomination process. And we certainly encourage everyone um, to tell and preserve the stories that you know in your communities and help us open this up um, and, and be as inclusive as possible. We can't have inclusive history of Virginia unless we surface these stories, record them, and incorporate them in our teaching and in our writing. And so that's what this program really is intended to do. And we're so proud, Krista, that you were one of the honorees this year because, wow, you certainly, certainly deserved it. And your remarks at the program the other night were wonderful. So thank you for that. Well, thank you so much, Sandy. I'm so appreciative. And that, I really love this program. I mean, I know, I mean, I'm from Florida, um, grew up in the 80s, and I just really wish, one of the things when I go back to talk to students in my high school is, I say, I wish that I would have had more real world examples. Like, I love learning about all of the famous African Americans or women in history, but what about the people who are making history while, you know, I'm here. So thank you so much to have the library participate in that. So Zakia, talk to us about the work that you do. I mean, there are so many ways to teach black history and I was with you. Zakia is my sorority sister, very proud members of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. And we were on a panel together and I first got to meet you last fall. And I I just love the way you infused history like with every answer. So talk to us about the work that you do and how you teach people about Black history. So first I want to say I greet everybody with peace and thank you to Network Nova and to you Krista for inviting me to be here. I'm so excited to have this conversation and to utilize this platform to talk about ways in which we all can engage ourselves more in you know Black history in the United States of America. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, so I started and I founded an organization called Rebuilding Timbuktu. 
And Rebuilding Timbuktu is an organization that is intergenerational, it's virtual, we utilize Zoom. We also make sure that we do read alouds so that we can encourage people to rebuild black consciousness and to rebuild black libraries. And what do I mean when I say that? Just like what um, uh, Ms. Treadway said, we all the time overlook the scholarship of black authors and black thinkers and all of this scholarship is sitting right inside of the library rafters, is sitting right inside of the archives and we don't access this information because in somewhere in our minds we have devalued all of this work that has been contributed to our understanding of the world, American democracy and everything else because it didn't come from the right package. So Rebuilding Timbuktu is all about encouraging people, all people, educators, families, and everybody to read this scholarship, read this research, and have conversations about it. It's not about knowing all of the information in the world, but it is about starting somewhere. And I'm ex extremely happy to be here on, in a moment, the honored um, Congressman John Lewis. I love Congressman John Lewis. He's an Alabamian. He understands firsthand and he stood up to democracy in America that was operating just like a dictatorship, except he was living it here in a place where freedom is supposed to be extended to all people, but it wasn't happening. And as a 23 year old at the March on Washington, he stood up to democracy and he asked pivotal questions. He asked critical questions. How long are we supposed to be patient and wait for the government to be responsive to our needs? He also asked questions like, Where's the political party that's going to make it so that we don't have to march? Where's that political party? Where's the policy that's going to be written that's going to incorporate all people in the United States of America? So my message is to read, plain and simple, read the information. If we read the scholarship that was left behind by Congressman John Lewis as a 23-year-old, there is no reason inside of any of our classrooms while we're saying, well, I just don't know what you all are going through. Oh, I just didn't know that this was happening. We have so much scholarship that's happening um, in Timbuktu in the, the 14th century. The biggest export that was coming out of Mali Timbuktu was scholarship. It was books, not gold, not salt, not sugar, but books. So that says that reading is fundamental and we have so much information that's at our disposal that we can read. And real quick, I just wanna highlight two other spaces that you can always go to learn information. The Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem, New York. You can engage it on its website, the Schomburg.com. You can also go to the um, Association of African American Museums that's led by Vedette Coleman Robinson, who is a Virginia State graduate, just like me, woo, and a Howard University student. Um, and she's the executive director. So you can access the Association of African American Museums at blackmuseums.org. There is no reason for us not to know who the African American person is in American history and what our contributions are. And the wrap out Black History Month, Dr. Carter G. Woodson said that we oftentimes overlook or we don't talk about Negro history, but the purpose of Black History Month is to talk about the Negro in history. What has the African-American person contributed? So use Black History Month to review what has happened, what Black people have contributed to the world rather than using this as the starting point to start learning about Black history. So I'm excited to be here and just start a new ways of teaching history. Start with what was written so you don't have to feel like you're reinventing the wheel. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Zakia. And we have some questions for you in the chat, ask you to list some resources. So I know she will follow up with that. And Zaria, um, your poem was absolutely fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. And everyone in the chat is saying so as well. So Zakia really left us with an important point about the, how uh, John Lewis at such a young age was courageous and bold and was being activist and stood up for what he stood, stand, stood up what he meant in his, in his life and you are doing the same thing. So talk to us about why it is so important for young people to continue in John Lewis's legacy of leaving good trouble, making good trouble. Well, I, I really do oh, have- Oh, I'm sorry, that's for Zaria. Sorry, oh, it's for Zaria. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, I believe that it's important for the youth to continue John Lewis's legacy because the youth is the next generation. We're gonna represent what the world will be in the next couple of years. And so the best 
that we can do right now is to continue to represent others and continue to um, solve the issues that we see. And one way I'm doing it is by using my writing and my poetry to try and represent other people who may be in a similar scenario as me or for people who need to learn what to do and what not to do in a classroom environment. Excellent, excellent. So Zakia, you were gonna jump in as well? Oh no, I was just gonna say, I wanna applaud this generation because they are definitely not being patient and they are not waiting. Mm -hmm. And so it's as if they have taken a page out of Congressman John Lewis's playbook when he gave that speech at 23 years old. And I wanna say, go Zaria, which is Z girl name. <laughs> Z girls rock and I loved your poem. <laughs> And I like that you are standing up and, and, and utilizing your words, you know. And the other thing why it's so important for us to read the documentation and to read the, the just read all of this scholarship is because we have to know that in the 21st century, we are not inventing anything new, you know. So this work has already been done, but the problem is, is that we haven't accessed it. So once we take the time to actually read, then we can move away from becoming a nation that is just um, a soundbite nation, a microwave nation. Every year during Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, we always say, I have a dream. But did you read the totality of the message that he brought to the United States of America? Did you read the indictment that he made against the United States of America beyond having a dream? Did you read the indictment and all of the other speakers made on the United States of America and not living up to its creed and its purpose? And how many other Black scholars have actually said, the United States of America, this is what you say, we the people, but I am the people and you're not li listening to my voice. So Absolutely. I think it's important to keep reading. Absolutely. So we only have about 30 seconds left, but if each of you, Sandy, Zakia, and Zaria, want to say just 10 seconds of any action items that our guests can take. Well, uh, certainly, uh, I hope you will nominate people for the Strong Men and Women program going forward. Um, I'll also put in the chat, um, we do take a lot of the documents that Zakia just mentioned, and we make them available online in, in their digitized or, or transcription form. But we need people, you know, the old handwriting is sometimes hard to read. So we have a transcription project where you can actually help read these old documents that relate to Black history and transcribe them so that modern audiences can use them. So I'll put that link in the chat as well. Excellent. Thank you. Zakia and Zaria, any other final comments? Um, I'm going to put the link to my poem in the chat for everybody to read. And later on, I can have the video of me reciting it. And I'll also <laughs> put my email. And that's it. Awesome. Excellent. And Kia, I see you put your information in the chat. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we didn't have more time. Turn it back over to Catherine and Chris. Well, everybody's just get ready. I'm going to turn it over to Chris Matthews, musician. And uh, she is making good trouble with her music. She played for us at the Women's Summit. She's awesome. I'm so excited that Chris Matthews is here. And I think I want to say something about Tracy Chapman, Chris, um, she started writing when she was eight years old, when she wrote that song, Revolution. I know you know it. Uh, and so I know that she's an inspiration and you're an inspiration to us. So I'm gonna turn it over to this live portion of the show. Thank you so much, Chris, for being here. My pleasure. Such a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I'm gonna start with a song that is kind of a, a look back, thankfully. I wrote this um, just before the Women's March in 2017. And uh, that time kind of ushered in what I was pretty sure was gonna be one of the scariest chapters in my life. And I remember calling home to my mom and telling her how scared I was, um, you know, being a, a black butch identified lesbian who, who at that time was in an interracial marriage in Virginia. It was very scary. And her words to me were, were simply, you know, baby, think of me as a little black girl growing up in southeastern North Carolina in 1953 and everything that I lived through and I am still here. And I think a lot about John Lewis having lived through everything that he lived through 
and still being here and still being so full of love and hope and showering so much of that onto all of us. And so this song is kind of about that. Uh, this is called Battle Hymn for an Army of Lovers. As Dr. King said, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And so this song is a call to arms for the Army of Lovers. Change is coming once again Except this time it feels like the world's about to end White-robed devils in plain sight Angry protests in the streets night after night And it weighs heavy on my mind Why are we so quick to run backwards after all this time? But I won't let it change my heart I was born full of love and hope, and when I die, that's how I'll depart. And when you find yourself incapable of seeing eye to eye, remember when they go low, we go high. Change is coming, that's for sure. We gave a madman all the keys and let him walk right in the door. And I don't think he'll see the light until the whole world is on fire. But that's all right, that's all right. We will still be here when he's gone. And if he doesn't kill us all, well, it sure will make us strong. So don't let four years change your heart. We were not born hating each other. Now is not the time, not the time to start. And when you find yourself incapable of seeing eye to eye, remember when they go low, we go high. soldiers it says let us live to make men free we're all sisters we're all brothers standing on each other's shoulders there's no wall we cannot scale we are an army of lovers and we shall not fail so when you find yourself incapable of seeing eye to eye Remember when they go low, we go high, we go high, we go high, we go high. song that I want to sing for you it was actually written for and inspired by the late great John Lewis. Uh, this song actually comes out on his birthday this Sunday uh, the 21st and this is called Call Them In. The thing that was so powerful about John Lewis was even with everything that he went through, that he endured, that so many others, so many other black people, black Americans in this country endured for the sake of freedom, for the sake of democracy. Even with all of that, he still, at the end of the day, it was enough, you know, to call out injustice. That's great. We want to do that. We want to call out injustice. But to then take that next step and call people in, invite them into this big tent of ours to try to then be an ally so that we can actually continue to further that quest for freedom and democracy. That was such a beautiful thing about him. And so this song very fittingly is called Call Them In. You'll recognize hopefully some of his brilliant words all throughout. The battle lines are drawn and once again, somebody saying, wait, be patient. If they knew how long it would be 
Before all people could truly hear freedom ring I wonder which end of that moral arc would they choose I wonder if more would have walked in his shoes This is what, this is what revolution looks like You gotta get in and then stay in this fight You've got to find a way to get in the way Speak up, speak out every day Freedom Riders, or Letter Riders, do what you can, just shine your light brighter. Somebody called him a saint among men, a founding father, an icon, a legend. Ordinary people with such extraordinary vision In a country so young Hard pressed on every single side But not crushed Saying in God, love and justice we trust This is what, this is what revolution looks like You gotta get in and then stay in this fight You've got to find a way to get in the way Speak up, speak out every day. Freedom writers or letter writers, do what you can, just shine your light brighter. Make a trouble every chance you get. Eyes on the prize, we're not finished yet. Don't tolerate injustice, my friends. Call them out, but then call them. That's not right, not fair Stand up and say we can do better He said I may not be with you When we reach the other side So let the power of love Everlasting be your guide Cause this is what, this is what Revolution looks like You gotta get in Then Stay in this fight. This is what, this is what revolution looks like. Get in and then stay in this fight. You've got to find a way to get in the way. Speak up, speak out every day. Freedom writers or letter writers. Do what you can, just shine your light brighter. Make a trouble every chance you get. Eyes on the prize, we're not finished yet. Don't tolerate injustice, my friends. Call them out, but then call them in. Gosh, Chris, you bring it, my friend. I, you know, really. And you, what a great way to close out the show because uh, it's never ending, is it? This no, truck. it is not. Yeah. And yeah. how are things going for you over over there with your music? Are you busy? Um, are you? You know, it's a, it's a pandemic. So all of, all of the musicians, our, our livelihood kind of depends on people gathering. And the thing that keeps everybody safe right now is not gathering. So, right. you know, all of us have, have kind of been out of work since last March. But, you know, this this time that we're living in, for me, especially as a, as a social justice songwriter, you know, this has been one of the most uh, productive times of my life, actually, as far as creating, um, just because I've kind of been forced to sit still. So, uh, yes. you know, like I said, the song about uh, Representative Lewis is coming out on Sunday. It's one song on an entire album uh, of social justice music called Changemakers, which comes out on the 26th. So, you know, we're hanging in there. We're, we're trying to still create. We're still trying to get in good trouble in every, every way yep. that we can, uh, despite everything. So, well, 
please feel free and I we could put your information in the chat. I encourage yeah, everybody please. in this uh, room to reach out to Chris if you want to hire her for a show. We <laughs> always support her. Yes, we understand thank you right now with the artists that we try to always, you know, definitely pay artists if we can. And you've been a great friend to us and we just love you and you just inspire you just inspire us. So thank you so much. I, I just believe in the in all of the work that you all are doing. So thank you for for doing all of that and uh, keeping the pedal to the metal even in the pandemic. Yeah. That's so incredible. Well, that's a little Trace me Tracy Chapman fast car. That's good. I like it. <laughs> got a fast car. I got it. Hilarious. We're gonna get in it and ride away. We're gonna do it. Okay. Well, thank you again for being here. We're gonna close out the show. We have a couple more minutes and um. Again, we, we know, you know we'll be calling you to come back for the for another for another session of music with us. So thank you. Happy to. Thanks yep. so much, everybody. Stay safe out there. All right, everybody. It's that time again where we're doing our show wrap up. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm just really just had such a good just such a good feeling today. First, I want to say special thank you to everybody, all the guests, our special young poet. How awesome! Keep up the good work of writing. And an educator, Zakia. It's my first time to meet Zakia. So you inspired me. Oh my gosh, your words. And the librarian, Sandy. I love it that people can go there. Who knew you can still help with that kind of work and writing, um, and reading and all that. That's kind of old-fashioned work. I love that. So thank you for speaking on that. And then Krista Jones. First of all, let's just call it again. You won that award. You won that honor, and it just inspires me. So congratulations on that being this year's uh, one of the award winners for that history award. Um, and then of course, Matt Rogers, anybody wanna look him up and support him, he's running for office. And then of course, I thank you to Delegate Sahara for being here. All right, so we're gonna run our credits. One thing I wanna say again, thank you to our backers. Um, next week, we're gonna have quite a show next week. We're gonna be making a lot of trouble next week. We have Rachel Bittekoffer here, political analyst. Nick Nudston from Demcast. And I think, um, uh, Krista, your friend, uh, Kevin? Kevin Boston Hill to talk about communications. Yeah, Kevin Boston. So between the three of, the, three of them, it's all gonna be about messaging our narrative. And we know as Democrats, we do have to get really better at how we speak, how we frame our narrative, how we talk about what we believe in. So next Friday at noon, Rachel Bittekoffer and then Nick Nudston from Demcast, who's a big, uh, on Twitter, if you don't know Demcast, look them up because they are getting grassroots messaging out all across that universe. So let's get ready to, anything else, Robin, I'm missing? Stare, before I close it out. Stay in the after chat. All right, let's roll credits. <laughs>